Good morning, everyone. Happy Monday. Welcome back to Faith Family Focus season number two, and this is episode 44. I am Faith Suggs, your co-host, Duke Women's Basketball graduate and CEO and founder of Brand by Faith, a social media and branding company dedicated to telling the digital stories of our clients. This wonderful man next to me is Schaefer Suggs, former NFL player with the New York Jets and the Cincinnati Bengals, and has also served as VP and on the executive board with the RPFPC, NFL former players of Chicago, Good morning, Dad. Happy Monday. How are Happy you? Happy Monday, Faith. Sucks. How are you? Good. Where is my statue behind you? Like, what's going on? Oh, yeah. It, it's, it's somewhere else. <laughs> well, it better not be broken. <laughs> it's not broken. <laughs> I know we're missing it. <laughs> better oh, not be what, broken. What a, it's in the closet. What, do you mean, you mean jump off and put it back where it's supposed to be? No, 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 no. I, it's just what people don't understand is I have to watch that around you guys. I'm about to take it. Soon. <laughs> I don't know. You guys treat it bad. Um, I don't treat it bad. It's your brother turns yes, it around the other way. He doesn't, like, he doesn't like you watching him all the time. <laughs> There's a hat like on my face. Whatever. Just take care of my statue. But good morning. Happy Monday. It is only January 10th. It feels like we are already three weeks into January. Well. No, seriously. It's crazy. But I don't know. I feel like January, the start of a new year, always kind of runs a little bit slow. Um, but we do have a bunch of stuff going on now that we are in the second week of January starting it off. We have a wonderful football game tonight. I would love championship to game. Yep. Alabama and Georgia. Who do you have? Well, I, I don't really care. Um, okay. Well, if you had a million dollars and they said, Schaefer, you have to put it on one game or else they're going to take all the money away and give it to the worst person in the world. Which team would you choose? Alabama. Alabama, why? Because they just seem to have, uh, you know, it's like some teams just um, always play better against another team. Uh, mm. we, we always start against the Patriots. Alabama always beats Georgia. So I don't, I mean, they beat them in the SEC championship game. So I'm going to give the edge to, to Alabama. Um, and hope, but I just want it to be a good game. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope to be a good game, and uh, I plan on watching it. Yeah, I will probably watch it here, too. Um, I'm very interested to see. And you know another question I have on all of this, and we can discuss this later in the show because it kind of ties in what we're going to talk about today, is how long Nick Saban is going to keep doing this <laughs> because he's been doing it forever. It's very well, amazing that he's been this successful for so long, repeatedly every single year. And it's not a surprise. He's created a culture around his organization, which is another reason why you said Alabama's going to win tonight, because we have seen them win so many times. We just have a feeling that they'll be able to be successful in these type of situations. But it's very interesting watching him do it year after year after year. It's, it, it's impressive. It is impressive. And how much, how much longer can he do it, you know? So Nick Saban is the uh, Krzyzewski of, of football. He, you know, basically you get the players that are the most elite, dominant, um, five-star players. They go there um, and they play one year, they play two years, and they go to the league. Um, and his, his ability to maintain that, that, that status of elite players that want to go there right just been consistent just like Krzyzewski you know you're gonna get those players and not only do you get one or two players but do you notice on his roster which really kind of separates him from the other most of the other uh football programs SEC is an elite program um is their depth normally they have one two three deep that can go play in the national football league yeah, and that's why, that's why you see uh, oh Robert Campbell. That's one of uh, Devin's uh, parents uh, from from Yale. <laughs> nice, welcome. But but that's what you get, Faith. You have a very elite program, um, and you know Devin got a chance to meet uh, Mike Stock and Rich Wingo that played bat played football with me at. at um, and uh, he pl they played under uh, Bear Bryant. Bear okay. Bryant was very similar, you know. So it's a reputation, um, you know. It's just consistent, and he's gonna probably coach until 
I mean, I don't see I don't see him retiring anytime soon. Um, yeah. Sure, you know, yeah, you know what? You know, he also tried his his uh, luck in the National Football League too. You know, he did Michigan State, but he went to the Dolphins. And he yeah. came back, but uh, he is he is a, a elite coach, and you know, I think uh, you know, and we'll, we'll talk about the portal a little bit too. Right. Uh, he he benefits from that also. So I mean, I know that was a long answer to a very short question. <laughs> well, the the question was how long do you think he's going to do it? And you said basically until he's in the grave, which isn't surprising at all because he does give you that vibe. Um, I will say this about Nick Saban is if he is the definition of it's not broke, don't fix it. He's the example of that, and he's showing a lot of universities that you can stick with one coach for a very long time. Um, coach K. Um, Calipari, Gino Ariema, Pat Summit, you know, the, the, the great John Wooden, the greats of sports. Right. They show that, you know, he has set a great example about how he has kind of set a monopoly for him in Alabama. There's it's, a certain standard, Faith. Yeah. He, he, yeah. He, that you mentioned there's a standard. Right, he, a winning standard. That, right. That's what it is. And because of that, he recruits high-level athletes because they want to win a national championship as well. They just want a piece of it. Um, and that's why he gets continuously great athletes. Now, it's very interesting now. On the basketball side, that is not holding as much weight as it once did. Duke is getting great recruits, but now we're going to see the turnover as all these great coaches. You know, Bill Self got a, a lifelong deal at Kansas, but, I mean, how long does he really want to be in, in Kansas? And then you have Calipari. How long does Calipari want to do before he takes him to the crack? At who knows? Maybe retirement, but maybe he goes back and wants to do um, ownership in the NBA. You never know. But it's very interesting as we're seeing this turnover of older coaches and more successful coaches and are winning these coaches of all time step down and step away and, and pick up these more um, advisor roles. How will these dominating schools kind of adjust? But then again, we see the future of sports now. We see the Dawn Staley's of women's basketball. We see, you know, the 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 um, Deion Sanders, right? We see the switch happening with these younger player coaches stepping in. It's going to be very interesting if they just create their own dominating forces or, you know, we see a completely different NCAA sports uh, platform for sure. Right. What I hear you saying is that there's definitely a transformation in the coaches. I mean, the... There's, there, there's a few icons that are still there that have been able to be successful uh, because they've been adaptable, they've been uh, transcendable. Uh, but you see this new age of younger coaches coming in that uh, are, are taking over, not only in uh, college, but you see it in the National Football League too. Right. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. But you know what? That's just, I, I, that has a direct correlation to branding, marketing. Um, what people are presenting themselves as for sure in this new world. Um, they they got to advocate like for themselves. And it's very interesting to see how, you know, quick Dolphins coach fired. We learned about it this morning. He's gone. He's out. Whoa. I didn't hear that. Yeah. He's out that he, they, they announced it this morning. Okay. And, they, and you know, it's just, you see people like Mike Tomlin who's been successful in Pittsburgh for so long. It's just, it's funny. You see the difference and it's just, you never know. That's why you got to keep advocating yourself and setting those, stepping up to tar par and setting those standards each year for yourself. But very interesting stuff. I'm glad to hear you have Alabama tonight. I have no idea. Um, I want Georgia to win, but then again, there's something in us that still wants Alabama to be successful. Um, don't know what it is, but... Um, well, we have family memory with Alabama. Your Uncle Sam, so we got to keep it in the family. <laughs> he, would, he would love to hear you say Alabama. Roll Tide, yeah. Roll Tide, right? So... Roll tide. Um, well, funny story before we transition it. My former coach at Duke, Joanne P. McCauley, uh, she did a – in her off season, she liked to go and um, shadow a lot of great coaches. She shadowed um, 76ers organization prior to Doc Rivers there. If you guys don't know, the uh, GM and with 76ers is a Duke grad, as, long, as well as Adam Silver, Lisa Borders, a whole bunch of powerful people within – professional basketball and so she she shadowed the 76 and then she also went in to alabama and she shadowed nick saban for a week um and if people know this distinct difference between how to run a football program and how to run a basketball program is everybody knows the difference right? right football has to be entirely more disciplined because how many 
kids are on a football team, right? 50 plus. Right. Okay. And you look at a basketball team, it's about 15 kids, right? Right, right. Um, football, you got the kids split up, split up by position. In basketball, you only split up by position maybe throughout practice, right? And so maybe like for 20 minutes. She came back after that and had us doing, you know, we stand in your spots before practice and warm up and clap at the same time and all this stuff. We were looking at her like, lady, you know that they do that because there's 70 kids on a field and they all got to hear each other. We can hear you. We're right next to you. We promise. It was just a mess. But she said that she has such an eye opening experience and the level of discipline and standard that he sets for his for a program. And it trickles down through every single right. coach that is serving under him. It's just right. Is is very um, up to par what you think it would be. Right. So, right. Right. No, I remember you shared that story with me. That's funny. Yeah, it was funny. <laughs> it's fun time. Um, because she took some, more to that story because there was drills that she ran. We were doing up downs. <laughs> we were doing up downs. I would up down. What am I gonna do with this? What am I gonna do with an up down in the game? Well, you're diving for the basketball, right? <laughs> No. I mean, you you led your team in charges, so you probably learned there was probably charge drills there too, right? That she actually no, <laughs> oh god, no, it doesn't make sense. But good morning, everyone. Welcome, welcome, Black. We're happy to have you guys here. Um, we are welcoming new people. If you are new, feel free to share the show and and let someone know we're going to talk about the transfer portal today. Um, we've covered so many conversations and topics surrounding this, but we never really dove into the transfer portal, which is making me laugh because we touch on it almost every show, but we never dedicate a show to it. So um, if you're new to us as well, like I said, Schaefer Suggs, former NFL player with the New York Justice Cincinnati Bengals, Faith Suggs, me as your co-host, daughter, and former Duke women's basketball graduate um, for four years, graduated in 2019. But um, so we have a, a wide variety of um, knowledge surrounding this topic of the transfer portal. Um, I want you to back up, talk a little bit. I know you, I know you want to get into stuff, but, but talk a little bit about the uh, the the huddle. Um, and you you you're going to share because you had a really good guest on this week with your own individual show on Friday. You're saying last week? Yeah, yeah, you, um, yeah. Talk a little bit about the huddle. Yeah, The Huddle is a solo show spinoff from Faith Family Focus hosted by me. Uh, we haven't had a live show in a couple weeks. We Everyone is lost in COVID, everyone's lost in work, and everybody's lost in everything else. So we're pretty busy, but it is definitely something we run every Friday. If you missed it, we've had at least 13 shows. Um, guests, Nolan Smith, Sports Illustrated, Ashton Nicole Moss. We've had uh, Paralympic gold medalist, Abby Duncan. We've had, you know, we've had a wide variety of amazing guests um, to give us you know, a worldwide of topics. We talked about, you know, disability, depression. We talked about uh, bereavement. We talked about um, a woman in a working world. We talked about um, an amazing, amazing show with Kirby Porter, former women's basketball player at Harvard. She had an amazing show talking about branding and um, just the new student athlete NIL um, world and how to navigate it. And she actually released a new company today. I can't remember what it's called, but Always up or moving with Kirby Porter, amazing show. So yeah, we've been really lucky to have a great spinoff every Friday for those of you who are new. Um, try to catch it. We try to rerun them as well so that, because um, I know they're really far down on their Facebook, but we would love people to be able to check them out because they're just all were amazing guests so far, for sure. So this is your own interview you spin off called The Huddle. It's on every Friday. Uh, it's a great show. Folks, she doesn't like to talk about herself, but it's a phenomenal show. Wonderful guests and... Uh, I just look forward to, 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 I mean, yeah, I thought the, the Moonlight Kicks, uh, with the, oh, yeah, that was great with the, the first women's shoe. Women's, uh, first, women's Moonlight Kicks yeah. is the first basketball shoe, um, dedicated to women's feet. Women's feet are different in five places than men's feet, if you guys did not know. Um, the only shoes that we don't tailor directly to the woman's foot is women's basketball shoes for some reason. Um, and so this year, I mean, actually Under Armour is trying to roll something out as well, but Mula Kicks released their first, well, four styles of their shoe. Um, and it's out in Dick's Sporting Goods now, which you can check that show out. I'm trying to remember, I feel like that was episode 10 with Natalie White, Mula Kicks founder and CEO. Um, 
backed by a lot of investors, a lot of amazing investors. You guys um, would be very interested. And I can't share that, but um, it, it's a great, great, great company. If you guys look into once again, that's Moolah Kicks, M O O L A H. Moolah Kicks. It's at Dick Sporting Goods. You might have it in the Dick Sporting Goods near you. But we had a great show with Natalie as well. Okay, good. Um, but yeah, so catch that every Friday. We'll try to get new ones out to you when we can. Um, but it, so far, we've been really blessed to have 13 great guests so far on the show with the huddle. Um, well, welcome back, everyone, to Faith Family Focus. We are really excited to dive into today's show, um, which I know what, why you guys stopped by. We, we, it's going to be a very interesting conversation. And I guess we can kind of kick it off because before we even dive deep into it is what was transferring in 19... 19- 60, 70, 80, 90. What was the mentality surrounding that? And dad, you can kind of give us a little bit of insight, look into that. Um, Cause I think it very much influences how we view it today. Well, I don't, I can't give you an insight on it. Um, I, I, it's very new to me. And that's why I really wanted us to, to, to do the show. But I do know prior to athletes being able to go from one school to the other is they had to sit out. And this is completely changing the dynamics of sports, the college sports. Now kids can actually put their name in a portal. And and uh, now that became the recruit mechanism for college coaches. I, I All week, since you decided you were going to do this show, I'm watching Twitter and I'm watching all these kids formally announcing that they are entering the portal. Mm-hmm. And it's pretty interesting to watch now that it's such a big deal. Basketball, football, um, and how it impacts not only teams that are losing players, but teams that are going to acquire players. Now, how is it going to impact the programs, the incoming freshmen, right? So, uh, and I know that Shane probably has his own perspective on it from a basketball perspective, but I think it's a really good thing for college sports. Um, the ability, I'm just concerned a little bit about um, you know, okay, okay, wait, 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 don't give us that that perspective just yet because I have okay. things that I want you to dive into. You just covered okay. it. So, to give a little rundown on those who don't know, the transfer portal was created within the last two seasons, kind of, um, to allow a space for student athletes to place their names in and try to find the next school that they want to transfer to. Transferring is the, the process of moving from one school to another and finishing out your co- collegiate career there, um, academic and athletic. Um, when you go to the transfer portal, College coaches can then see your name, the school you were at, where you're from, and any film or footage they have on you playing in that sport. Soccer, basketball, football, uh, volleyball, whatever it is, you can enter the transfer portal. This is fairly new. Since the transfer portal started in its first year, in one year, 15,000 student athletes have entered the transfer portal. In 20 20- that total, all different sports? All different sports. Okay. 15,000, yeah. In 2018, let's compare the numbers and let's kind of push our conversation. In 2018, only 39% of student athletes everywhere have transferred. Okay, so 2019 was a 39%. And now we're looking at a 15,000 student athletes a, during the year. Okay, the first year transferred. Now, when the rule happened, and this would really push the transfer portal over and open, the rule was in 2018. In order for you to transfer, you had to sit out one year, okay? Which wasn't bad because a lot of student athletes got their their master's degree, right? Or they were able to, you know, get a three-year school swap or whatever it was. The only thing was if you transfer within conference, the two-year sit out, transfer anywhere else, it's one year sit out. And if they're if you have already graduated from a four-year institution, you can transfer and play right away for your fifth year. That was the only time you could ever play for one immediately. So when the NCAA created that rule that allows student athletes to no longer have to sit out, the transfer portal kind of blew up. And so what we're here to talk about today is a little bit the effect the transfer portal has um, on the sports world of collegiate sports, amateur sports, which isn't the case anymore, um, why it happened, and also who does it affect the most and who does it benefit the most? Um, And that, that is the biggest question because we're watching the NCAA completely turn and change in front of her eyes. So I guess my first question, I want to kind of start prior to the portal, prior to this rule change, prior to it all happening, is prior to the portal included a year of sitting out. Do you think that the incident way, and this is a discussion question we could banter off a little bit, because I'm I'm very interested as I was writing this, is 
do you think that the reasoning behind allowing super athletes to play immediately after transfer that first year or any year, I should say, but playing immediately, what was the mentality behind it for the NCAA on your end of it? Why do you think they wouldn't allow it to happen? Well, I think it's interesting how it, it happens like almost simultaneously with NIL, National the name image like this. I think it that really impacted that decision. Um, I think prior to that, was it fair for coaches to uh, leave and go to other universities? And a lot of times these kids go to schools because of the coach, which is unfortunate. Yeah. But now they're stuck too. So I think the NIL had a lot to do with it. Um, I don't know the impact from your perspective, but I think NIL really uh, pushed the, the narrative around uh, athletes being able to um, have the flexibility of going to allow themselves to be branded and marketed anywhere in the country. Right. You know, it's interesting. It's very 100%, I think, influenced by the NIL name, image, likeness. Stuff. Okay. Um, and the reason I think that is because, first of all, NIL has been something we talk about paying athletes for how long, right? It's been trending for at least a decade. Jay Billis is a big pusher behind it. Yeah. NIL, name, image, likeness for folks that were just joining the show. So, yes. Like a, yeah. So, and when it started, I think that it opened the door to a lot of things that were going wrong with the NCAA. And one of the biggest re things that was wrong with the NCAA is you hit it right in the head is the fact that these student athletes are picking a school because of a coach, which you can't say it doesn't happen because it happens. You have to, who do you spend the most time with that coach who decides on honestly the happiness of your career and your day-to-day -day activity, the coach and that those, those that staff that you choose to play for. And so they will spend a couple of years recruiting you too. So you right. Have that relationship. Have that relationship. Right. And yeah. so, when those coaches are allowed, and we see it all the time, they hop and hop and hop and hop. Why? Because they're adults, and because adults do that when they have jobs, okay? We continuously, I think, treated these student athletes like they were children, and I think that what we were struggling as the NCAA, way, what we were struggling to see is that, yeah, they're not adult adults, right? But they're not children. And the fact that some of these children cannot make $10,000 per Instagram post because of the name image likeness rules is proving to us that they very much can handle what they're being thrown at. And so the name image likeness discussion and criticism very much opened the door for the transfer portal because the fact that these student athletes weren't allowed to, to change schools if they needed to get home without um, losing a year, if their staff left and they had to go to a staff that didn't even like them, if they... Um, didn't like the, the degree or the major that they were scheduled to do, right? When I went to Duke, I had no idea they didn't have a business major. No idea. No idea, right? But obviously I made it work because major really doesn't matter in life as long as it's not, you know, creative studies or whatever, movies, cinema. It's, unless you want to be that. that. That's what they tell athletes is you pick the major now that you think you can apply to life. And so what I'm learning is is the biggest takeaway is transfer portal would never open the, the transfer rule never would have been sliced if nil wasn't brought up and those two kind of come hand in hand and they also kind of came hand in hand when um the women's basketball final four controversy came about when that was again? The, when they showed the inequality and discrepancies between the weight rooms and the women's NCAA March Madness tournament, which wasn't called March Madness at the time because they weren't trademarked for that, and the men's side. And that was an uproar. So it was just a big, I think, snowball effect of things, right? NIL was trending for years. Pay the athletes. Let them have um, access to what their name is him. Blah, 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 right? And then we have Transfer Portal. Let these kids transfer when they want to. Blah, 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 blah. And now we're hitting inequality. Now we're hitting everything that kind of rolls within the NCAA way. And it's, I think that it just is not stopping. And so now we're where we're at. We're in a space now where everything is open, <laughs> right? It's, and it's very interesting right. on how we're doing right now in present day with it all. I remember I was still coaching when the rule was up in the air. And we, um, we had student athletes who had transferred that year because they were relying on that rule to disappear. And 
all I can remember is just waiting and waiting and waiting for them to pass that that rule and change it and change it. And change it. But so many student athletes transferred, hoping that that rule would change so they could play immediately. Right, right. But well, now there's a real change. What is your biggest opinion of the portal so far? 50,000 student athletes transferred in the first year. <laughs> it's a lot of people transferring for the better. <laughs> um, I don't know how many spots are on rosters. Football obviously probably leads the way in that because um, football is a waiting game for sure. And I think it's very interesting. I can give my perspective on basketball in the sense that I think it's an amazing thing for basketball. I think it's an amazing thing for those 15-spot roster sports, 15 to 20, um, because you're actually – you actually can be going from the 12th spot to the sixth spot in one year, right? You can go from the 12th spot to the sixth spot to a different coaching staff in a year, right? In a couple months, really. And immediately be put in a better position for you, right? And so I think that's an amazing thing for basketball. For football. Well, let me say something, Faith. I heard something on uh, when Kansas State was playing. Um, that coaches need to adjust to playing and adapting their season each year versus trying to build a program over a four-year period. Every year they got to adapt to a new program. They got to adapt to to the players coming in. And if they don't, they're going to lose out. They're going to not figure it out because of the transfer portal. Wouldn't you agree? And it's even deeper than that in the sense that when we talk about coaches, Who get fired easily, <laughs> right? Right, right. You get like a three-year contract, and you got to prove yourself in order for you to get re-signed for an extension. The transfer portal um, can be really great for them in the sense that they can grab new talent, or it could be really great for them in the sense that they can get rid of old talent. And I think that people forget about this this other half of it, right? The old talent, get rid of the, the old, old talent. talent. Get rid of the people you don't want on your team. And that's the thing that happens, right? I saw it happen at Duke. Um, not to talk out, outward about it, but I saw it, I've seen it happen multiple occasions where student athletes are sat down and the, the staff says, look, we're going to find a better place for you in the portal. We're going to speak highly of you. We're going to call for you, but you cannot return next year. And that was always reminded to us, I mean, told to us because – it was kind of a threat. It was like each year you renew a contract, right? Every and, one year you're renewable. <laughs> right, right. Each year you, they can t- decide to send you elsewhere. Um, but they never did it because it was so dang hard to get the kid to another school because you had the one year sit out rule. So transferring was still like a any yeah, weird yeah, hard right. thing to do, right? So, but now with the transfer portal now being a kid can leave in a month. Coaches are handling it like this is the um, free agency, right? right? Hey, this isn't the place for you next year. We do truly wish you well. We're going to give people a call. However, please enter your name to the portal, right? And now the Clemson coach is like, oh, wow, so-and-so entered the name in the portal from Notre Dame. Let me grab him right away. Let me call him and call him and call him. So it's, it's, it's very much a great benefit for these coaches if they learn to adjust to it, right? And I think it's great for the younger coaches because they get it. For the older coaches, it's hard because we had this weird mentality surrounding transfers. Like when I was playing, transferring was like, oh, you transferred? Like, I don't know why we we looked at it that way. (laughs) We looked at transferring like it was a bad thing. We looked at it like, oh, they couldn't, they couldn't get right at the school they were supposed to be at. Right? Or they couldn't. They couldn't succeed or they couldn't just sit and wait their turn at the school we were going to see it. But my my freshman year, Lexi Brown transferred in from Maryland after two Final Fours and a national championship and just wanted to get to Duke, right? Um, and then we went on and went to a Sweet 16 and a tournament and uh, ACC championship game. But it was like it, what she kind of proved, and I think that was the, the curve of it all, she proved that, no, I'm not transferring because I'm not a winner. I'm transferring because I'm literally just – I want to go home. I want to be closer to Georgia. I want to be – you know what I mean? And so 
it's very interesting the mentality completely changed now right because what people don't understand is we really treated the transfers and the whole process so terribly back then like we made it seem like the kids aren't strong enough to just buckle down and do their best at the school they're supposed to be at and now everybody's transferring everybody's making a run for it everybody trying to chase their best opportunity good and bad and I say bad because not everybody can chase. There's not really always a great opportunity for people to chase, right? But for the student athletes who do have the brand, who do have the skills, who are a top future draft pick, they hold a lot of weight in their hands, right? They're like licking their chops right now in free agency. Like, hey, where's where's Alabama? Where's LSU? Where's this? Where's that? Right? So many quarterbacks are entering the portal. Well, wow. so as you're speaking, I'm looking at, I'm, I'm, I'm in my mind, I'm saying we're dealing with professional sports right now. Right. We're dealing with professional sports. There's no more amateur sports anymore. If you look at the NCAA right now, you're actually looking at the, the, the professional sports because now when you add, add name amateur like this, you know, now you have free agency. Right. You have free agency in, in, college, in college sports right now. Right. And that, my question back is getting back to, the, the coaches that I feel that are going to be successful are the ones that are going to be that adapt. Maybe different levels of coaches, different different programs are going to impact the most. But there's a there's a there's a tier of of programs that are going to have to be able to go. I have to adapt every year. My program has to be rebuilt every year versus having a two year program or three year program. Right. Every year it's going to be different. Every year I have different players. Mm-hmm. Would you agree that that's going to be the the maybe the the? That's what it is now. Okay. That's what it is now. We're entering what the second season for a lot of coaches yeah. since this rule change. That's what it's happened now. Carol Lawson brought in seven kids. Wow. You don't remember seven. Okay. He lost six. I so, do. Okay. Okay. And so you got to remember is we cleaning house wasn't a, isn't a new thing, especially for new coaches, right? And so this these two go in hand. So what I want you guys to picture is. Right now, between 2020 and 2022, we have lost a lot of coaches from that era of the Meisterschewskis, the um, Calipari's, the successful winning coaches, and even just the ones who have had long tenures at their universities. I was watching Bob Huggins the other day, right? They've been there for years and years and years, right? Form relationships with administration, da, da, da but they can't tap in now to the student athlete that is in their program anymore, right? These kids are different. They're mentally different, right? That doesn't mean the kids are weaker. That doesn't mean the kids aren't smarter. It doesn't mean the kids are more skilled. It just means that I think that they're more aware of the long-term goal, right? We, we throw these student athletes now in today's society into personal training, private training, uh, nutritionists, um, all these type of stuff leading up to college, right? So they're already pro, pro-minded, right? Yeah, sure. Their eyes are already on the end goal, right? And then when they get to college, they have more nutritionists. They have sports psychologists. They have rehabists. They have masseuses. They have all these things laid in front of them. And then they also now can make money off their posts. Or name image likes. Right? And so they're pro athletes. So a lot of these coaches that were, were in the era of buckle down, don't transfer, um, for the heart of the team, whatever it is that we try to say, that's what it was. But really, it just was just it was just that control. It was just that time, right, right? Right, right? They're leaving, right? So we're watching that turnover happen. Now we're watching these student athletes rise, and new coaches are coming in, and so the mentality around the org- the, the NC boy is completely different, right? And it's very much influenced, I believe, by age moving, right? And these student athletes. It's this this mindset of professional athlete experience, right? And whoever can offer the best professional athlete experience, I like that term. Most yeah. successful, most successful within the recruiting era, right? My Shashevsky has been so successful at Duke, and people don't understand this. I can give you inside look. Yes, he's Coach K. Yes, he is a great staff who. At least three of them have either gone to the national championship and every single one of them has either won one or been in the tournament. Okay. And all their student athletes are McDonald's all Americans. Right. But what you guys aren't seeing is that stuff isn't what's getting people to Duke anymore. Right. That's not what got Zion Williamson to do. What got them to Duke is that Duke invested into a social media hub. 
They hired at least five positions dedicated to branding, marketing, graphic design, video creation, all these things, right? So the kids walk in and they're like, ooh, fancy lights. Ooh, you put my name on that. Oh, you did that. Oh, you did that. Oh, we're coming, right? Who's going to brand me the best so that I can make more money and then get representation and then enter the draft and then become exactly who I am right now, but with millions and millions and millions of dollars per hour, right? It's the mindset of whoever adjusts the fastest wins, but it's what you're adjusting to is creating a space for those professional now professional student athletes to be successful within limits. And it you can see is that the earlier this year, especially when NIL opened up, we saw a lot of coaches push back on it, right? It was like, mm-hmm. oh, now the kids are distracted by their phones. First of all, who the heck is still worried about the phones? The phones are here to stay. The phones aren't going nowhere. <laughs> right? No, seriously. I know. Right? But it's the people who struggle with that are going to struggle with all of this, mm-hmm. right? Transfer portal. You know, those kids are entitled knowing they want to leave. They know their worth. They know their self-worth. There's no question about it. Now, do some have a, a, a weird view on how good they are? Maybe. Yeah. There's always a few in the bunch. But these kids that we're working with today are different. They understand that they have a lot of power in their hands on how they want to create the life they're going to create, right? And they understand that it could be their fault. But that's who you're working with now, right? You can't mold the minds anymore. The minds are already molded. It's what you do with them and how you get them to buy in is what creates your program. And that's why the transfer portal is so wonderful because it gives the student athletes the choice to choose, right? The coach, choose the organization, choose the program that they want to dedicate time to. And I feel like that just caused them to buy into it more because they actually made the choice after going through something, after knowing what they didn't like, after disagreeing with certain situations, they then made the choice to find the next school and find the choice, the school that works for them. I think that's, that is a great thing. When right, we talk right. all the positives of it, who benefits the most, student athletes and college coaches. So let's, let's, go back, let's go back when we when our, our your senior year when we were being recruited. Say this was uh, this say this was that time was this time. How would it have impacted our decision, your decision, about going to a college? Uh, probably not. But I was talking the other day. I mean, I, I went to Duke because I went to Duke. I went to Duke because at the other day I walked out with a Duke degree. Right, right, right. Um, kids go to Brown. Kid goes to Harvard. Kid goes to Yale. They walk out with. An Ivy League degree, um, because of COVID, half these kids can get two degrees now. Yeah, no, I get that. I'm just trying to. This interesting to see how people so, handle this new. How do um, how do how do you come out of high school, picking a school with all this change? We actually yeah, that's what I question. Yeah, we had this discussion of the day. I would go into school thinking that, well, I can move schools if I don't like it. Right. Right. But isn't that what we do with everything in our life? Yeah. Right? I mean, everything in our life, we have decisions, we have we make a decision, we either change or we stay, right? And what I think that is now thankfully lifted is that weight on student athletes' shoulders of like, well, you pick something, you should stick and finish it to the end, right? You should finish all your food on your plate. All these mindsets that we register for some reason in society, and this is something I've been really thinking hard about this stuff, is we tell kids to finish what they started, right? But it's how they finish nowadays that I think is the most important. Mm -hmm. I think that um, if I was a student athlete coming out of high school, I'm like, okay, I'll pick the college. But you know what? What if we're talking about the student athlete who maybe didn't come out of college highly ranked, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is a great opportunity for them to pivot and go after the school after having maybe a great first two years, averaging 25 points per game, whatever, right? They can now end up at a school that they wanted to end up at, but they needed to go somewhere, right? This, it it provides opportunities for kids to know that they can kind of mold the path they want to create, they want to live, right? But one thing that come out of this and is very interesting, the elimination of JUCOs, and elimination of prep schools. I'm very interested to see. Wow, that's a very good point. Prep schools are for student athletes who want to maybe take a gap year, get better, grab more recruits, recruiting um, 
more coaches interested, whatever. JUCO was for kids to do the exact same. Maybe they weren't highly recruited, right? Maybe they couldn't, you know, get the grades, but that's not always cha- the cha- the reason. It's normally that they weren't, weren't highly recruited. And then they blow out, blow up, right? But when you have the option to go into your first year and, like, immediately tra- change schools, it's rise within the NCAA, why go to a gap year school? Unless you must, right? But you, that's the only choice you have. Unless that's the only choice, why would you, right? Because eventually you could just change your mind again, right? Right, right. So that's one thing I see missing. Right, right. It is interesting as you speak, there's so many things that are going through my mind is, is you know, we, we in our making of the champion series, we talked about the influence that parents have on supporting the kids, scholar athletes. Now, how is it in help? How is it in? impacting the parents now. I mean, because their parents are going to be, um, it's going to be a healthy experience because they're going to allow their child to navigate through it and guide them. But then there's some that will try to get in, get in the lane and kind of navigate it for the kid. <laughs> Please share your perspective on that. <laughs> well, you know, And this, I say this about everything, but if you have to, you'll never be happy when you do the, 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 that, you know, because you're not pushing the kid to do something once again to make a choice that doesn't line up with who they want to be. Now, the issue, what we have seen with the transfer portal is the same issue we were seeing when the transfer portal didn't exist, when kids were getting recruited out of high school and parents were all over them then. And this goes with NIL too, right? How much money can my kid make? How much da 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 right? How many deals can my kid get and send money home? Yeah. There are 50,000 student athletes in that transfer portal the first year it opened. I don't think nearly half of those kids probably deserve to be in there. And that doesn't mean it's not because they're good people or not because they're great athletes, but because maybe their situation was truly created to be a bad situation by those who were in their ears. And that happens all the time. Oh, that's what I wanted to hear. Yeah. Right. And so we've seen a lot of kids enter the transfer portal out of schools where I'm like, you should have buckled down, buddy. Should have just finished that one out. Um, because a lot of them were jumping with no idea where they were going to end. And there's ki- there were kids in the transfer portal up to August, entering in August. Right. So they got through their first summer semester a summer training and they were immediately in the transport. You know how hard it is to pick up a new student athlete going into a new season, right? You need, you, in order for you to grab an athlete, you need spots. There's only about 12 to 15 spots on a basketball team roster, right? Right. Football is a lot more open, right? You're doing this simultaneously as you looking at this, navigating through it. You're trying to figure out how am I – well, like you said, it's going to be easier to get rid of players because of the portal because they don't have to sit out a year. Right, but what if they don't want to get rid of these – some of these – not every coach wants to get rid of kids. <laughs> but right? you talk about creating spots, though. How do you create yeah, but, spots? You know what? Spots? Yeah, but you know what? They're not – that's my thing. Like, you see the name in there. It's really not that cutthroat. It's really okay. not. Like, the college coaches aren't like, oh, so-and-so's in the portal. Let me <laughs> – oh, the weakest link. No, oh, it's not how it works. There's some of these relationships with the student athletes. Gee. But that's why there's an issue for these student athletes entering the portal because it's like some of you aren't even a five star recruit. Some of you aren't even a one star recruit. Mm-hmm. Understand where you lie within the incidental way, where you truly think you will end up. Because a lot of that, the recruiting is going to have to come from your end. You're going to have to find the next school. You're going to have to contact them. It's not as easy. You don't enter the portal and won the lottery. I'm going to Alabama or whatever. You know what I mean? It's a lot of work. That's a good point. Maybe talk a little bit more about that. That's a really good um, conversation to have for parents who are thinking about doing that. What does that really mean? Before, what I'm starting to see is a lot of illegal stuff, stuff, but I don't think it should be illegal. Um, of student athletes having conversations prior to entering the portal. And if I and Lord and said, boy, don't track down my future child in 29 years and ask them 
if we had this conversation, but I would 100% ask, start having conversations outside of before we enter the kid in the portal to see if there's schools that, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Because once you enter that portal, oh yeah, I mean, you, you can get out the portal, you can stay, right? But, but normally- You can't get out of the portal? You can, so what? what yeah, you, once you enter the portal, you can go back, but the issue is, well, who wants to take you back? Right, um, right. Some do, some coaches are like, yeah, come on. Or some are like, mm. well, why did you enter the portal? Let's fix, let's fix, fix why you entered the portal. Right, yeah, that's rare though. Um, <laughs> once the kid enters the portal, it's like, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> but it's 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 when I think about it, it's like yeah, yeah, I don't know, and that's all I can say about it. It's it, it's you do your best. I would call and have those conversations, whether they're illegal or not. I would see who would want to take my kid. I would see where I would lie, where what's good for us, what city, what market. Each school you play at has a market, right? Do I want to go to TCU, which is in Fort Worth? That's a big market. Right now, you, now you're looking at it from an NIL perspective. Right so now, I'm, looking at that. I'm also looking at hey, our family's from Texas. Maybe we should go to Texas. Right, you have family in Alabama. Maybe we should go to Alabama. You have family in New York. Maybe we should head up there. Right, it's just little things. A lot of things pie into why people transfer. Okay, some staff, some staffs have better medical help, better medical resources. That's a big thing that happens with people. Right, Kyra Lambert, who we had on the huddle, a couple of shows, but she's also been on Faith Family Focus. Had an amazing experience at Duke, but she tore ACL multiple times. And I know, never mind. There were situations where her the medical services weren't the best, right? So um, in terms of comparison to other schools, she went to Texas, no injuries, got stronger. Her branding blew up because they, they have a social media hub in Texas. And now she's still playing overseas, right? And so sometimes the pivot is what's best for you medically all together. And so as I think about it, it's like, yeah, I'm having those conversations. I'm, I'm putting the bait out there a little bit before I toss my name into the portal, right? Mm-hmm. Where am I end up? Who's interested? So I can kind of get my mentality around it a little bit because to do that with everything else in life, before you buy a house, don't you do research, right? Right before you get a dog, you go test out the dog. Before you get a car, don't you test drive the car? There's a lot of things that go into the sins we make in life. And so when I think about this, I'm like, oh yeah, I would definitely, if I was a parent, if I was a student athlete on my own, I'm hey, I'm calling so and so. I'm calling my AU coach. Hey, I'm interested in doing this before we do it. Can you feel around? Right? Who has spots? Who has doesn't have spots? Who's looking for a guard? Who's not looking for a guard? Right, like let me get my mind around this before I jump, right? And so that to me is the best way to go about it. Now, it's not always easy for some coaches because if you're not connected, you won't know. And once the kid hits the portal, they're immediately picked up. But um, it's it, uh, you have to, have to, have to, have to, have to at least prepare yourself for the process, right? Educate yourself on what position is my kid? Where does he lie within his peers? What schools would we would we love to go to? Why, where, distance from home, majors offered, resources offered, right? Little things like that is what I think. When you go into this process, you have to have a wide variety yeah. of research done. Yeah. It's still a great, great, great opportunity for these these kids, though, for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. And what 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 okay, we can continue to talk more and more about this. But that's. I really appreciate you really giving uh, our audience the lens on, on uh, all the different levels of, of, of this transfer portal because it really it's 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 a game changer. Well, NIL is game changer, but this is the game changer. Yeah, you know, it's one last thing that I want to ask you and what you think, and then you can ask me. How do you think the transfer portal has affected? coach's skill and how well a coach can coach i think a huge huge I think the coach is only as good as their ability to connect with players mm-hmm. that's yeah. interesting yeah they they got to be able to adapt bill belichick is great coach because he's been able to maintain his standard his foundation of uh, uh what what he needs but then he's always been able to bring in players and some of those players can stay for a little while, 
Some of them can stay for a long time, but he's been able to connect with players. The coaches are able to coach any player. The opposite of Bill Belichick. What's that? You know, say the they say the complete opposite of Bill Belichick. Who said? I, I don't know. What, what Four players. Doing? They say that he's not really the most connecting. I think. Um, that, well, why he, sets, he, he sets an amazing standard that you just do it. I yeah. He he he. I would go play for him, and I knew him when I was playing. He's a hard coach. You knew you know you get, but he's able for some reason to transcend with every. Every year, he's able to transcend. He's able to win with this new age of player. He had Randy Moss. He had he had all these players. Antonio Brown. They all came. They didn't last very long, but he's been able to bring them in. You know, some coaches would not even think to bring those kind of players in. Well, but, he had Cam Newton. What's that? He had Cam Newton as well. That was. Yeah, the, yes. Um. So yeah, but that but that's another thing is do I think that it relies on skill? I think that you're so right. One of the skills that you have to master to be a head coach in today's era is understanding it is what it is, yeah. right? In a in a healthy and boundary having way, right? Is like understand boundary, yeah. Allow mm-hmm. the Natalie's to be that be who they want to be, but find the pieces of them that apply to this your program and can get them to buy into that because they want to and that's just what it is and if you can't you got to step aside because you will not win you know who was able to do that bill jackson was able to do that yeah he was able to do that he, he was also able had, he also had michael jordan and kobe bryant so that <laughs> that could have made you a great coach as well right right but he needed the pieces around him but my 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 point is you're saying your six coaches that are able to adapt to this portal, they're going to have to have a little of that mindset. Right. To be able okay. to adapt. Agreed. 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 Yeah. You can't be old. Old is out. Sorry. <laughs> Get in with it. If you're, you're over 60, better start watching TV, talking to the kids, learning what it is they're going through. Because if you are not, if you are not accepting NIL and you are not accepting transfers, you are behind and you will lose. So that's the new world, but what, whatever. It's very interesting to see. I'm very interested to see where it goes for sure in a year and what it looks like. But thank you again, everyone, for joining us this wonderful Monday morning. We're so thankful for those who stopped by to talk to the transfer reporter with us today. I hope you guys learned a little bit. We'd love to hear any questions you have going forward. Just put them in the comment section and maybe we could talk about it next week. Again, thank you to Amazon Fire, YouTube, Facebook, Roku, and Apple TV. And, of course, our key platform out of Phoenix, Arizona, E360 TV. Again, this is Faith Family Focus. We're going to use our faith as a vehicle to help heal and sustain others on their path to strength and family core. And, of course, our slogan, which is on our Suggs mugs. Let go, let God. Let go, let faith. Let go, let love. Everyone have a wonderful, wonderful week. We'll see you guys on Monday.